Golly gosh, 20 minutes, so this is going to be a bit pacey. I was just talking to Mitch, I promised to show a picture of my boat, so look, there it is. Um, and I live on it. Uh, I woke up this morning slightly damp, actually, because it's been raining all night, and water coming through the deck. So it gives you a sense of perspective of uh, history, actually. It's 105 years old and full of computers and wireless networks and so on. And, and it made me think a little of this little bit of text, which um, I'm not sure anybody here wouldn't put your hand on your heart and say yay to that. It all seems pretty, pretty wise and sensible. And that text comes, of course, from a long way back. That was John Holt with the, um, the underachieving school back in, back in 68. So I think a lot of our values about what we want from learning haven't changed. I think a lot of our certainties about its need but golly gosh, um, pretty much everything else has. I mean, thinking back to my very earliest days in all this, here's, um, here's me chatting away. Look, I was younger then, my beard was ginger, you know, <laughs> interviewing a little blighter about uh, building a spreadsheet on a, on a, on a Macintosh. And um, today, of course, I've got a PhD student who's busy looking at um, very young children building literacy and numeracy and getting pretty excited about their capability. This is an um, 18 month old boy getting quite excited with his results. Uh, that, that hasn't changed. You know, we've seen that when you put children in front of technology, their eyes light up, they um, are fascinated by it, they're seduced by it. What has changed is where we are on the curve. That curve which you've seen, everybody will have shown you from, I guess Ray showed lots of them, Yes, there will be more um, throughout the whole session, but we're on that exponential curve. Everything that technology touches has gone exponential. At the rate we've decoded the human genome through to the, the power of your, the mobile phone in your, in your pocket. And what that has done to us in terms of how we make change happen is it's moved us away from the page when we used to pilot and iterate and test. You know, that 1985 um, bit of research with the children using the Macintosh, it took three years before we had a colour Macintosh. People talked for three years, I'm not sure we should have colour. The mathematicians remember, were against it, they thought it was going to be distracting, or too much, too much input, you know. Um, we haven't got that time anymore, now we've got pace, real, genuine, terrific pace. And uh, David, I think, touched on that well this morning in his introduction. But in a world of pace, that staircase model of change has gone, and what we're left with is rather nicely. It's a model of mutuality and collegiality and sharing and exchange. Fundamentally, it's a model of trust uh, above all else. And right at this point, although it's a model of trust, we don't really have, um, to be honest, we don't really have reputation engines we, we will have yet, but knowing who to trust and who's valuable and who's authentic is a pretty tough thing. In education, of course, we've got that absolutely. Because if they're standing in a classroom in front of a bunch of kids, you know exactly who they are and you know how they've got there and you know um, why they're there. It's around the world, people have started to understand that. I mean, we're going to hear from Jim later on, but he really did get it and, uh, and, and you know, threw in chain a project of building schools for the future. Not, you know, not, not scrubbing up the ones we've got. I mean, building schools for the future was as brave as anything um, on the planet, you know, and down in, down in Australia, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Rudd was busy with his BER buildings. You know, these are big, brave words. BER, building the education revolution. Uh, you know, so uh, people got it. And they got it at the policy level in a really rather exciting sort of way. And, and yet, the pace, the pace of this is too great to inform the centre, isn't it? There's an email from, from Estelle Morris um, a little while after she came out of office, which you can see, and, and I think there's, there's good honesty uh, in, all, in all that. You know, the loads of stuff that we know that works. So the things you've heard um, today and yesterday, and indeed throughout the most of the last two or three years, that you know with absolute certainty. You know that when, when teaching and learning is seductive and engaging, you know that when the learners absolutely have a voice, you know that you can hold that Hawthorne effect for as long as you like with, with refresh, um, projects. I mean, I, I tell you with absolute certainty that every project I've ever been involved in, every single one has succeeded. And, and I'd love to say that, wow, aren't I clever? Um, no, what's happened is the baseline was so dismally low. You know, almost anything we did worked because the baseline was so low. And the projects that really worked, you know, the, the projects that put us in the Guinness Book of Records, having the biggest internet project in the world, and so on, the things that really, really worked were the ones that terrified us. You know, when I woke up in the middle of the night, absolutely proper scared. 
you know, Stephen, you've gone and done it this time. You've gone too far. You know, proper fear. Those were the projects that really, really, really worked um, because those were the only ones that were ambitious enough to cope with, to cope with what was capable. And this gets really exciting because suddenly we've got the capabilities to swap those moments of fear with each other. Just come out of the session um, on, on CloudLearn, and CloudLearn's been a really interesting research project sponsored by the Nominet Trust. Go there, please. And it's full of all the crowdsourced common sense and wisdom of teachers who've been using mobile phones in the classroom, have been adopting Twitter and Facebook safely and sensibly. They'd all come to the same set of conclusions, hundreds of them. You know, for example, if you're using a phone in the classroom, the rule is the phones are on, they're on the desk, and the screens are up. Teacher looking around the class can see where they all are, can see when they're active, you can see when they're not. When you don't do that, they're under the desk, or tucked in a bra or wherever, and they're, they're doing mischievous things. But, you know, simple, simple common sense rules about how to make all this work. CloudLearn's been able to crowdsource them, bring them all together, and share them with everybody. And I'll tell you what, um, you know, it's full of good, sensible, safe practice. And we know that this stuff works because, look, this was um, some work one of my PhD students did, Stan Owers, a long way back, where he'd been looking at face-to-face -face and synchronous activity, building sociograms of the way in which people um, exchange. But this one, by the way, this is, a, this is a company run by two brothers who said, we're running the meeting because we want to hear from our colleagues. Yeah, right. You know, you know, the way sociograms go, the more you talk, the bigger the motorway. You know? And the, um, this one over here, by the way, is a, is a junior school where they're kind of at war with each other. It's like Agincourt. They're sort of sitting across the staff room throwing arrows at each other. But we know that when you move all that online, all the R words appear. Uh, you know, the, the words of respect. Well, you can read them. You know, people are, people are happy to research and to reinterpret and to return and even to regret and to be honest about it, to get a parity of esteem of contribution that really matters. And we have those tools to swap our certainties and indeed our hunches with each other. That's what makes this so powerful moving forwards. We've got the technology. And I guess the pace at which that exchange goes isn't just confined to head teachers. I mean, gosh, remember, I think... Leone, Leone Ramont sitting over there in the front row put 21,000 head teachers together in Talking Heads. Extraordinary project, you know. And, and Leone, one of the things we've, we got from that that was so cool was just that, that community of practice. But now when I go into head studies, they always tell me, you don't want to talk to me, you should talk to my senior management team. And when I talk to the senior management team, they say, well, it's not really us. It's, the very, it's, that, it's that generation of 25 to 35-year-old teachers, you know, the golden generation that have come into teaching because they came in in full employment. We'll never see the likes of them again. And they came in because they really wanted to teach. And the senior managers will tell me that it's the, it's the lead young teachers in that group that are leading them forward. And when I go to talk to that golden generation, they say, no, it's not us. We're listening to the kids. You know, the whole model is inverted just beautifully. And the children are leading learning uh, you know, with the license granted by their teachers and by their departments and by their line managers and by their head teachers in the most extraordinary way. And nothing else is going to pace. Look, this is some, this is some work that uh, was going on up in, um, up in Norwich where children were using GPS to, to draw on the streets of Norwich. So they're walking around the streets of Norwich. They're trying to draw a Viking ship. You can see... Um, they've got a bit lost over here, so there's a bit of a wobble in the, in the prow. And they were trying to be clever here and do a, a sort of wiggly line for the shields, but uh, you can see they're walking across a dual carriageway, so that was all going to end in tears, you know. Um, but, you know, that was, um, I don't know, four or five years ago. That gets passed on, and I'm down in Australia last autumn, and the kids say, oh, you know that thing in Norwich? Look, we've just done a Christmas tree in the local park. They just got out their iPhones, of course, and now a portable device. The kids are swapping the ideas with each other and passing them on and passing them around. Look, they've done lights and they've done it really, I think it's really rather elegantly done. And we know absolutely that our teachers can swap and exchange stuff too. This was the Courseware Trust we set up back in 1991. Big charity, quarter of a million pounds. Woohoo! Seemed like a lot of money then. Um, you could barely buy a cupboard in London now, you know. Or perhaps you can again, actually. But the Courseware Trust, we asked teachers to use Hypercar, that great authoring tool, to develop course, courseware for each other, and to swap and exchange it with each other, and then pass it around. And every year, we gave away a, C a CD-ROM full of the applications and the courseware little apps that had been produced by teachers all over Scotland. And we gave them a little bit of money um, for making the, the, their, their courseware a little bit more robust and for including 
a manual with it, and it really worked. And, you know, how many downloads did Apple have of their iBook authoring tool uh, in the last fortnight? Six, was it 600,000? You know, how many teachers out there are going to be authoring materials and swapping them and exchanging them with each other? How many children are going to be doing it? Well, you know really significant numbers. And what's exciting about this is the pace of all this. We've just been hearing in another session today from this group of students in Lampton School, and Juliet Hebel, my daughter's um, school, and you know they designed a heap of good ideas into their school, one of which was, well, look, it's a fabulous classroom that they've designed full of, full of mood lighting, it's got a Skype bar and so on, but one of the big features was that they could write on everything. Every surface is a writing surface, the desks, the walls, the whole thing, and they were excited about that because suddenly they've got the technology to capture it. You get a sense of audience writing on your desktop, you get out your phone, you take a picture, you've got a record, you've got an audience, you've got everything. Well, it didn't take long for that to get passed around. I was in um, Mark Oliphant's school in um, Adelaide uh, back in November and told, the, told them about this uh, at 2.30 in the afternoon at a staff meeting which was attended by children as well, by the way, as so many schools are doing now. I came back in at 9.30 the next morning and what do I find? I find kids writing on the desk. They found all the white tables. They've tested them with the whiteboard pens to see what works. They've got their shoes off. And if you know me, you'll know that I'm nutty about shoes off learning because it really works. Really hard to be naughty with your shoes off. They've got their shoes off. They're writing. And what is it that they're writing? Well, actually, they're writing about the impact of color uh, on their behavior because one of the things they learned from the Lampton kids was that the LED mood lighting actually affected them. And blow me down, uh, what do I find when I pop into Microsoft um, earlier this week, I go in and I say, and they say, look, yeah, we've nicked that idea too. And they've stuck some opaque material behind the booths and they're busy writing on the walls, taking photographs with their cameras. The pace of change and exchange of this is fabulous. And isn't it exhilarating that suddenly we've got corporate sector coming into learning saying, actually, we've got a training budget and a training manager and we know about training, but we don't know how to do learning. But we're aspiring to be a learning organization We'd like to hear from you. And the companies are not coming in to talk to the head teachers. They're not coming in to talk to, um, well, you know, the senior policymakers. They're coming in to talk to the children and the young teachers in their classroom to find out what works and what. And that really matters. Listen, I've been um, interviewing those children in that classroom to see what their hopes and dreams are for higher education. I'm just going to play you a little snippet of that. We've just got time, I think. Um, because what's happened here is a model, an entitlement has occurred. They then just know that learning, they then just know that learning could be better. They're expecting it to be better. And this is really quite interesting, talking to children who, between 11 and 15, designed their own learning environment about what they're hoping We're going to talk a little bit about university life. Um, about what they're hoping for for university life. But tell me a little bit about this space, first of all. What's, what's special? Yeah, what's special about this place? The classroom was designed by students, uh, so it was designed by the people who are going to use it um, now and for future generations, and it incorporates a lot of the things that we use at home and technology we use at home and technology we're familiar with, and I think that um, helps, and I think that's what makes this classroom like really unique. It's quite good for group work, so if we just want to move to our own space in the classroom and we need something to write and we don't have to search for paper and pen, and we can just get one of the board pens and write things down. And I love the coloured light around the... Does the coloured light change during the day? How does that...? Yeah, they're mood lights, so we can, they can change themselves or we can change the settings. So you can set different mood colours, can you? Oh, very good. Do you think you'll get spaces like this in, in university? Well, I think universities would have probably thought more about that because they're more experienced with students. Maybe they're bigger and there's more students, so they have more opinions. I know that when I go to university, there's going to be like a range of different types of learning styles, and I'll be able to choose the styles that I like to learn in, and it'll be more independent. And, you know, on what you hear loud and clear, this is a video I've made for university vice-chancellors, by the way, uh, I, I really have, you know. Um, what you hear loud and clear is the sense that, well, we designed this class and there were six of us, a university with 6,000 young people, all smart. Of course they will have thought to ask them what learning should be like. How could they not think how good it's going to be then? It's going to be a 1,000 times better than the one we've just designed, won't it? There's the maths, you know. So that sense of entitlement, I think, will not be... You know, the genie's out of the bottle, I and mean, it won't be finessed, and it won't be moved forward in a gentle sort of way. And I'm excited by that. One of the things they mentioned in their classroom was that they're at this point in their technology, they're at a post-appropriation point. And it's a real clear line in the sand. And most of you will have used 
oh, slide rules and calculators and, and um, one per pupil, laptops, and, but it was always a standard thing. You always had a class set. If you had, if you, even with a slide rule, it had to be the... Jim, was it the Faber Castle slide rule? It had to be, I think, probably, you know, it's, uh, something like that, you know, and the calculator had to be the Texas Instruments, whatever. You know, at the point we're at now, schools are not delivering class sets of mobile phones. The kids are coming through the doors with them. You know, we're at a clear post-appropriation point, and the point we've reached is exactly this. It's bring a browser. It's not bring your own device, because your browser could be running on all sorts of different things, but just bring a browser. Get your kit, bring your pen, get your shoes off, bring a browser, let's get learning. You know? and, and that is a really clear change in where we're going with all this, an exciting change. It's not to say that things haven't got lost a little in all this. I was doing some work with a group of children at BET, 11-year-olds, and we were having fun um, teaching them to program in four days from a, from, from a standing start. One of the things that became immediately apparent was that they needed some of that base understanding that they would previously have got from primary school. They had to whip out this old um, um, uh, logic board and, uh, and sit it in front of them. And by the way, I couldn't even get a battery for it. It was so old, I had to hack a USB cable to make it even, even work. You know. But suddenly, that sense of making and creating and swapping and exchanging is at the heart of where we're going with all this. Kids have stopped being those information consumers, and they've stopped being education consumers. They've gone back to being technology creators, and they've gone back to being education creators as well. Look, I, I popped into the toy show. How could you not? You know, it's just next door. And uh, I stole a badge, you know, pretended I was an important toy buyer, and, uh, and rushed in. I couldn't believe how, how, how it had missed the whole zeitgeist of where kids are at the moment. It was like watching, it was like visiting a show 15 years ago. Look, you've seen, you've seen kids on, on, um, on these kind of things. This is... Uh, uh, yeah, I can do this. This is a balance bike. This is my little granddaughter. The very first time she got on a bike at, at two. There's no pedals. She lifts her feet up. She's cycling down the hill. You know, it turned out that kids could balance all along. You know, we'd been giving them stabilizers and tricycles, and uh, I didn't need any of that. They actually, they were very good cyclists. You know, and uh, and it raises that whole question, I think, of how good our kids might be. And I don't think. The toy show is going to discover that. I think schools are going to discover that. If I stand on the roof of a school, as I said a million times, and look around, you know, where else have we got a community of postgraduate researchers, people are thinking daily about the complexity of learning? Flipping heck, it's, it's, it's a windy day, the school is different to when it's not a windy day. You know, somebody's hurt in the school, it's a different place. You know, kid gets hurt in a road accident, the school's different for half a term. You know, teachers coming to terms with how many variables are there in learning? You know, where else have you got a body of professionals doing anything that complex? Schools are the intellectual powerhouses at the heart of our community. What's happening now is they've been allowed to go, and they've been allowed to go their way. And I think people, a few people are terrified of that, but for me, I'm absolutely exhilarated by it. Two quick last thoughts. Firstly, look at what they're doing with data transparency everywhere, because for sure, we're not going to build better learning with all this freedom for our children, we might just build better learning with our children. And this is um, one of the schools I'm working in in Australia. Look at the level of data transparency. The day I saw this, this little girl was telling me excitedly that she'd moved up from, from four to five, and she was a good five, she reckoned. At the same time, she was telling me that there was a kid down here was saying he moved all the way from the red numbers to the end of the green numbers, and he'd done it in a term, and they were congratulating each other. That sense of mutuality, that collegiality, that ipsative referencing of their own same progress is such a powerful weapon. Why would we not harness it? You know, we've got data, we can share it, and it is extraordinarily seductive. And yet, when I walk around schools, I find people terrified of the prospect. I find schools like this one in Chicago, where they had a special room for the 21st century. I, <laughs> I took this photograph last year, and I thought, well, if that's the 21st century going on in there, what's happening in the rest of the place, for goodness sake? You know? And what was happening, of course, was this. They were being told what they couldn't do. They were being told, I love this one. It says, look, the computer lab is only available for detention or uh, turn it off. Or, um, oh, this was in Alaska. You, know, you, can, you can bring your gun in, but take the ammunition out. It was OK. You know? um, I love this one. This is the Learning Resource Centre, but you're not allowed to bring learning resources. You know? <laughs> uh, and, and so I love the underlining of must there, particularly must, not just must be switched off, you know. And actually, no, nothing, no, uh, I think. 
I think this has been the kids' response to this. I think they've just got on with it in the most exciting and the most exhilarating way. And I'm thrilled with where they're going with all that. Last two thoughts, and uh, oh God, the light's flashing. Last one thought. Um, these days, I'm a professor in uh, Spain as well, um, in Madrid, in a uh, fab place. And uh, this was a conference that ran there just the other day. And look at the Global Education Forum. Just look at who's comparing it. They're kids. And look at who's doing the summary at the end. They're kids. And look at who's over here on the platform asking tough questions to the people who beamed in. They're kids. And look at those over here in the audience. It's old folk. And honestly, I think that's where we are. You know, we need to trust our children to do better learning. We need, our trust to, we need to trust ourselves to be learning professionals, and we need to trust our systems to get out of the way. We've just had an extraordinary moment in this country where the Minister of Education said, I've talked to kids about ICT, they said it's boring. I've talked to the industry, they said it's irrelevant. I don't know what you should do. Would you go and sort it out? Would you talk to each other? It would be nice if you open sourced it and we start in September. You could not have more freedom than that. The question is, whether we respond to it or not. If we don't, the kids are going to go off and build schools on their own, and they'll be fab. But I don't think they'll be quite as good as the ones we might have all built together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Three years I'm not sure we should have colour. The mathematicians, remember, were against it. They thought it was going to be distracting or oh, too, much, too much input, you know. Um, we haven't got that time anymore. Now we've got pace, real, genuine, terrific pace. And uh, David, I think, touched on that well this morning in his introduction. But in a world of pace, that staircase model of change has gone. And what we're left with is rather nicely. It's a model of mutuality and collegiality and sharing and exchange fundamentally it's a model of trust uh, above all else. And right at this point, although it's a model of trust, we don't really have Jin Jane <laughs> interviewing a little blighter about uh, building a spreadsheet on a, on a, on a Macintosh. And um, today, of course, I've got a PhD student who's busy looking at um, very young children building literacy and numeracy and getting pretty excited about their capability. This is an um, 18 month old boy getting quite excited with his results. Uh, that, that hasn't changed. You know, we've seen that when you put children in front of technology, their eyes light up, they um, are fascinated by it, they're seduced by it. What has changed is where we are on the curve. That <laughs> Golly gosh, 20 minutes, so... This is going to be a bit pacey. I was just talking to Mitch, I promised to show a picture of my boat, so look, there it is. Um, and I live on it. Uh, I woke up this morning slightly damp, actually, because it's been raining all night, and water coming through the deck. So it gives you a sense of perspective of uh, history, actually. It's 105 years old and full of computers and wireless networks and so on. And, and it made me think a little of this little bit of text, which um, I'm not sure anybody here wouldn't put your hand on your heart and say yay to that. It all seems pretty pretty wise and sensible, and that text comes, of course, from a long way back. That was John Holt with the, um, the underachieving school back in, back in 68. So I think a lot of our values about what we want from learning haven't changed. I think a lot of our certainty is about its need, but golly gosh, um, pretty much everything else has. I mean, thinking back to my very earliest days in all this, here's, um, Here's me chatting away. Look, I was younger then. My beard was curved, which you've seen. Everybody will have shown you from, I guess, Ray showed lots of them yesterday. There'll be more um, throughout the whole session. But we're on that exponential curve. Everything that technology touches has gone exponential. At the rate we've decoded the human genome through to the, the power of your, the mobile phone in your, in your pocket. And what that has done to us in terms of how we make change happen is it's moved us away from the page when... We used to pilot and iterate and test. You know, that 1985 um, bit of research with the children using the Macintosh, it took three years before we had a colour Macintosh. People talked for 